speak. Okay. So now you can hear me as well. Um, so I'm from the University of Western Australia. Um, I have a position also with CSIRO, which is the Australian Government Research Agency. Um, and this work is jointly funded by, well, it's been funded by um, the University Grants Council of Hong Kong um, some time ago when I was based there, and more recently by the Australian equivalent. So um, let me start with turbulence and try to provide a, a segue between the topic of this conference and what I want to talk about. And um, I want to start with this thing called Tarkin's Theorem. So um, I learned a couple of days ago that the way to motivate talks here is you've got to start with some really old paper um, and then move forward from that. The best I can do is 1981, but um, this, was, this is kind of one of, it's sort of the foundation of nonlinear time series analysis, which is um, what I'll be talking about later on. And it's a field where we're trying to understand and quantify chaotic dynamics from measured time series from the system. And the question that, that um, Floris was looking at here was um, related to turbulence. So people were trying to understand turbulence um, People are trying to understand turbulence by the so-called power spectrum, um, trying to decompose the signal into its periodic components and understand those to understand the dynamics. The problem is, if you're looking at a system which is actually chaotic, this is not a terribly good way of going about it. And so what he was looking at was how to understand if indeed there existed a strange attractor in these sorts of systems, how would you look at getting that out? And in fact, there is actually a kind of fluid problem in this paper. Um, the, it's a taylor Coet experiment, and um, I won't lecture anyone in this room about that. You all know more about this than I do anyway. So um, essentially, all they were doing was measuring a velocity component at some point. So they've got the spatial temporal system, turbulence, and they're measuring a time series out of that and trying to do something with that time series. Okay? And that's kind of where I'm coming from as well. So let me now leave the turbulence and the motivation alone and talk a little bit about um, the more recent work that we've done, which has sought to um, extend the idea of Tarkin's theorem to situations where you have real data and it's really a mess to try to reconstruct. So the general framework that goes back to Tarkin's and before that to topological um, theorems of people like Whitney and Main um, is you have a scalar time series, xt, and you reconstruct a vector time series, vt, by taking lagged components of the scalar time series. Right, so the framework here is all that I can measure is a scalar time series but my system is probably not one-dimensional, so my state vector needs to have more than one component. And I get those additional components out of the lagged versions of that. Okay. Um, a simple intuitive way of thinking about why this might work is that by taking successive scalar components, I have information by which I can construct successive derivatives, and I can therefore construct the state space in terms of a single scalar component and its derivative. So, an nth order ODE system. And I'm then interested in how those dynamics evolve for the vectors. Um, there's a lot of technical issues with that, not least of which, how do you know what the embedding dimension is a priori? How do you know what a good choice of lag time is? How do you measure these things? How do you separate signal from noise? All these issues come into play, especially when you've got complex, complicated signal from a high dimensional system. And I'm not even going to touch on the fact that your system might be infinite dimensional. But we took a kind of pragmatic approach to this and said, well, okay, what can we get out of the data? Forget about what the original system may really be hiding down there, but what can we actually extract from the data? And so the basic idea is that 
we represent this object not as a strange attractor, not as a reconstruction of an attractor in time delay coordinates, but as a network. And the reason for that was, well, I had a couple of PhD students at the time and in the early mid part of the first of last decade, networks were cool and people were interested in them. So we're kind of just using the network tools for this reconstruction. The bonus is that it gives you a whole new bunch of things you can measure from this network perspective for your system. Um, so if you do that, we now have basically three different objects that we're considering. You've got the time series up the top here, which is what you're measuring. That's all the information you have about the system. Okay. Um, you've got the standard em embedding theorems, which give you this um, thing in Euclidean space, which is a representation of your attractor, which gives you the dynamics. Successive points in here is your temporal evolution of your state variable. And we're constructing this new object over here, which is a network. Now, the way that we're constructing the network, the nodes on the network, and for any pure mathematicians in the audience, network equals graph, but I'm using the physics terminology just because that's where things have popped up. Um, the nodes on the network are different states, and we're connecting states, not because that's where your system evolves from and to, but because they're close together in your state space. We're going to change the rules of the game later on, but I just want to introduce you to this earlier idea first, um, primarily so I can show you some pretty pictures. Um, this is a time series generated from the Kaldic Rossler system. That's the original system in XYZ coordinates. It's three-dimensional ODE. It's chaotic. It's got the classic stretching and folding. Um, the dots are your observations sampled at some regular time interval, and the yellow lines are just joining the dots. The thing on the bottom is the network that we get out. And what's immediately clear to me at least, is that that kind of, well, um, if, I can get, if you look, zoom in on it, right, you can see, oh, I killed it. If you zoom in on it, it's not handling that well, you saw it for a second, but if you zoom in on it, you can see there's this recurrent sort of self-similarity in the structure. It's all this complicated interconnection between points. Sorry? Yes, but not just the distance between points. We, we construct, so the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're looking at distance between points, but we only connect points to their K nearest neighbours. So rather than having like an epsilon ball where all things within a distance epsilon are connected, we're only connecting the top few neighbours. That's the closest neighbours. The, dis the distance... In this picture... Oh, so this picture is just a representation of the network. The space in which that picture is is abstract. The points are placed in a Euclidean space based on what's called a spring embedding. So we are taking the points who are either connected or not connected on the network and placing them so that points that are connected are close together and points that aren't close-ish. There's a, there's a, we use a spring constant between the points so that you naturally want points that are connected to be attracted to each other, and you naturally repel points that aren't. Well, this is, the visualization is not central to what I want to do. It's just. I'll show you on the, I'll show you on, can I show you on the next slide what I'm actually quantifying. Yep. This is just a picture to show you the motivation for what we're looking at. I think you, you know better than most um, where this falls down. But let me just skip forward in that case to the next part. And if we take this network and then ask, now points are connected if they are close in the Euclidean space of the embedding. We only connect each point to its k nearest neighbours. That means that if you have regions of state space that are relatively sparsely populated and relatively densely populated, you will have a similar number of connections, right? So we are equalizing over the measure of the space, if you like, which does a few strange things.
But if we just look for a very simple property, and that is, in this picture, if we take that graph and look at what small subgraphs we see, okay, so how often do we see each of these different patterns of connections between neighboring states? Right, so if I have four nodes on the graph that are connected, they could be connected in one of these six ways. If I count up how often each of these things occur and look at the relative frequency of that, then I see, in this case, one particular ordering of these different graphs. And this is for noisy periodic systems. If I do the same thing in the case where the underlying system is chaotic, what you notice is that the ordering of these subgraphs changes. And this is a very simple consequence of the local topological dimension of your attractor. Right? Because what's happening is, if your attractor is locally one-dimensional, you can't see this occur. If it's locally higher dimensional, then you will see this occur. Does that make sense? From the data to the graph? From the data of this time series. Okay, so, so the data to the time series is standard embedding. Having done the standard embedding, we're in a Euclidean space, and then I look at the nearest neighbors to each point. Nearest in space? In space to each point. I rank the nearest neighbor. It's coming long time later. Sorry? Even if it's, yeah, even if it's coming a long time later. So I'm assuming stationarity, looking for which neighbors in space are close. Yep. There's a fixed number of neighbors here. That's the parameter. Four in this case. And so each point is connected on the graph to its four nearest neighbors. Now the reason for doing so, if we just put an epsilon ball around this and said, okay, we'll have connect everything in those epsilon balls, then that's just recurrence plots, which I guess you've, you know of. But by doing this, we're, measure, we're looking at something slightly different. And when I get to the next part, I'm going to throw this away and do a different method of doing this, which actually looks at the... So once I've drawn all those connections and I've got the um, entire graph, I then look at all the subgraphs on that. So take every vertice on, vertice on that graph and look at all subgraphs containing that vertex and three of its neighbors. So those, those subgraphs of four nodes could be one of these six different things. Up, only that it's one of the closest neighbors. Just closest does better with a centimeter or Exactly. And then you put it on the same edge size in this picture. Yes. Right, so there's... <laughs> so you know now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I won't ask if you're happy with it, but I'll ask you, does that make sense now? Yes, the method makes sense, yeah? Okay, so this was the first thing that we did. We saw that we see these different subgraphs. And the question that we ask, of course, is why would this happen? And the one, this, this one here? So this is, this is all just experimental. Um, so this is, depending on what type of time series or what type of system I'm generating a time series from, I then do the embedding, I then build the network, I then look at the subgraphs, and you see different subgraphs occurring more or less frequently. From right to left is most, uh, from left to right is most frequent. Yeah. So all chaotic flows do the same thing? Low dimensional chaos. If it's hyper chaos, if you've got more than one positive Lapinov exponent, it does something different. And again, it's related to the local dimension. Right? If you're on a higher dimensional flow, you've got more degrees of freedom to see your nearest neighbors. And all noises do the that's So that is, that's the trivial case of just pure noise. So that's just going to fill up your embedding space. It doesn't, because of the way we're choosing the neighbors, it doesn't matter as long as it's IID. Uh, no, periodic flow and chaotic map, it's these two here that cause the switch. Now, this may seem to be splitting hairs because it's just one transposition. But on the previous page, you could see... Uh, periodic flow and chaotic... Oh, chaotic map. 
chaotic map and chaotic flow is the same. That one I'm not sure about. I think I've just copied the wrong line for that. I'll have to check that one. It is different from chaotic flow. And it's, this, is one, this is one of the unsatisfactory things about this method, and I'm sure you can tell me others, but this is one of the unsatisfactory things about this method is that I'm doing a sampling. So everything is essentially a map right, because I've got discrete states. Yet, if the map is generated by a chaotic flow or if the map is generated by a chaotic map, they do look different from each other. Um, the, the only important thing about the sequence of patterns is that if you ask yourself why would some things be more frequent than others, and again to emphasize, I'm talking about more frequent on a logarithmic scale, so I'm counting up these things from a graph that I'm generated, but there's orders of magnitude difference in the frequency. And the reason is what I want to get to on this picture. If you think about, for example, a periodic system where you've only got one degree of freedom, then my nearest neighbors are on that same one dimension. If you think about pure noise where you're filling up whatever your embedding space is, then your neighbors can be in any dimensions. So for example, if you're in one dimension, you can't have this structure because it's, no? Yep. They are embedded all the periodic orbits. Yep. You look at the very long periodic orbits. Yep. Very long periodic orbit. It is periodic and it's indistinguishable from the strange and and very long periodic orbits. It cannot be that you have one indistinguishable the other. Low order periodic orbits. Uh, right? Okay. Yes, if we have a time series, then that time series could be period periodic of period equal to the length of the time series. It could be chaotic, it could be anything. All right, so, again, going back to what I said at the start, I'm concerning myself with what I can extract from the data. So assuming that I've only measured the system for so long, I'm already discounting, if you like, the possibility that it's a periodic orbit of order the length of the time series. Okay? I think, um, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is say this was the first way we were doing this to kind of motivate what we want to do. Now, I'm going to skip forward instead and say, well, there's a different way in which we construct this, which comes from some work that people have been doing looking at um, permutations of your points of your time series. So the basic idea here is that everything I've shown you so far, I'm connecting things if they're close in space. And there are some real problems with that. In some sense, it would be nice to have the connections that reflect the dynamics. So I'm connecting things if, one, if, you're, if I'm evolving from one state to the next. Okay. The other problem with the method I've just shown you is that it scales with the number of the length of time series. If each point is an embedding is a new point in your time series, the longer the time series, the larger the network. Which is kind of a little bit contrary to what we would like to get to if we want the network to represent the system. We want to converge on something. So instead, if we think about somehow partitioning your state space. And so the basic idea here is um, you've got your time series, and instead of considering that raw time series, consider the order of the points within that short segment. So by this, I'm taking, and the one parameter here is the window size, I'm taking four successive points, and what I'm saying is the first point in those four is the smallest. The third point is the largest, the second point is the second largest, and the fourth point is the third largest. Right? So it's just the relative size of those points. Right? So I've chosen a window length. I've got W factorial different possible permutations that could occur. And I now say each of those permutations is a node on the network. So I'm now looking at transitions between permutations. Now, why might this be interesting? If you think about the logistic map, so here is the identity line, the logistic map, and the second iterative of the logistic map. So if the logistic map is f of x, that's f of f of x. And if I look at the possible orderings of points that can occur just in that simple one-dimensional map, 
these are the five orderings that I get. Uh, one of them, it's simply not possible to get out of the deterministic system because of the way that particular map is moving the points about state space. Okay. So now that's the way that I'm going to represent the nodes in the network. And I'm going to connect them if I go from one to the next. So does that make sense? Correct. This is with this system you have an event, you have an, you have a generating partition which you can generate easily. Um, in this system, there you can get to that generating partition. The, in general, you can't, but you can also always look at the coding of the points in this way. So maybe. Let me skip forward to, oh no, let me start, start with that one. So if we do this trick, we generate these networks here for different types of sim signals. All right. So the number of nodes in the network is now a reflection of the number of permutations, the window size that we've chosen. Looking at the system for longer and longer is not going to give us more nodes once we've sampled well enough to have seen what the system will do is going to give us better estimates of the transition probabilities between those sequences. Right. Then we go from, so we don't actually need to have the delay embedding. We no longer need the state space, we no longer need to be concerned with how far points, how far apart points are in the embedded space. Because we're doing the simple encoding which in some very specific instances is a generating partition, but which in general is not and doesn't need to be. It's just a representation of a region of state space which can be got robustly. Right. So the key here is that I'm working from data. And I want to be able to generate this in a way which is robust to noise, to all those sorts of problems that we have. And the first illustration I'm showing you here is the first um, refuge of an experimental system when we're not very confident of the experimental system working in general, we've got an electronic circuit. So an analog computer generating the data, we can generate lots of data, we can generate it very cleanly, we can get reasonable representations of these pictures, and then we can go and force that circuit through its bifurcation, through the period doubling bifurc bifurcation that happens to occur. And then we can measure properties of the network that we've generated at different points in that bifurcation spectrum. All right, so these prop so this is the this is the largest Lapinov exponent. These three, however, are different. So it's the largest Lapinov exponent estimated from the time series that I've generated from the system. These are three properties of the network that change over the same bifurcation spectrum. That's just the same picture just to show you. This is actually the property of the network. It's, a, it's related to the out degree of the node, the mean variance in the out degree of the nodes. And you see it varying over the bifurcation spectrum, it dropping down in the periodic windows, which is not too surprising because it goes from being um, chaotic over the observable time horizon that we're looking at to being strictly periodic but it manages to pick up all those periodic windows, and more importantly, it's increasing in a similar fashion to what the Lapinov exponent is increasing. I, yeah. Sorry? On the, here? It's a period doubling bifurcation. So it, start, so I, it starts with a period one, goes to period two, period four. So it's the, I haven't shown the part where it's just period one, just because it's further away. But if it's periodic, it's still going to have the same sort of low value. Now, let me just finish, because I've already got a lot of questions. So let me just finish with, OK, what can this do? What can this do if I have some data that's more realistic 
than an electronic circuit. What can I do if I have something where it's noisy, it's high dimensional, I've got limited observations of it, so I don't really have a hope of estimating the dynamic invariance and all those other properties that um, you might like to have but generally can't estimate. So in that situation, uh, where am I going? We want to be able to measure something from the network which is useful. And back to that permutation sequence, those permutation sequences are the nodes on the network, and I'm looking at transitions between those nodes. Given those transitions, we can calculate these entropy-like quantities, which are the either the distribution of the sequences themselves, which has nothing to do with networks or the dynamics that I'm talking about here, but just the relative frequency of the codings. The transitions between those states, which now reflects the transition between states in my space, or a global average of that. Each of these measures has a single parameter, which is the window size that I'm looking at, which is, kind of, which is just going to be a scale for your dynamics of your system. And here I'm going to show you, okay, I'll show you two sets here. So first of all, this is some data that we recorded from um, patients in a coronary care unit many years ago undergoing transition from normal sinus rhythm through tachycardia to fibrillation. And, okay, if we compute these entropy-like quantities from that network and then look at the distribution of those points for two different sets of the parameters, we separate out most of those different rhythms. That's good. It's not too impressive because if you give the same time series to a cardiologist, obviously they can tell you whether you're in fibrillation or tachycardia or normal sinus rhythm, most of the time. Part of the reason it doesn't work entirely is that these are clinical ECGs. So they're only, they're, they are measured at a fairly low resolution. This is 8-bit data, um, a very fairly low sampling rate just so that the people on the clinical ward can see what's going on. It's not research data, it's clinical data. Um, if I then do the same thing with a different data set, this is called the Fantasia data set. It's um, recordings of EEG for old people and young people. Young is defined as someone under 42. I didn't make the classification, so don't argue with me on that. Watching the movie Fantasia. And again, the same, play the same trick, build these networks, look at these entropy scores for different parameter values, so different time scales, and you see these cloud of, clouds of points which kind of separate young from old. Of course, it's surprising that there's any separation at all here. The signals all look the same. Some of the old ones are kind of closer to the young ones than others. That's um, probably accurate of most of our experience, not everyone acts their age in the same way. So some old people were more like the young people and vice versa. Um, but what we can do is repeat this trick with different sets of the parameters and look for separation of two clusters. And we do it in higher dimension, we actually do get that separation. And this is just the scatter plot of that variance mean uh, three standard deviations and outliers for those two data sets. I think I'm out of time, so I'll stop there um, and finish on that slide and ask for any more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice talk. Is there any other question?